Hey there, my name's Gary Sims and this is Gary Explains. Now Arm have just made an amazing announcement in that it is now allowing chip makers to add their own custom instructions to Arm-based chips. Now before you leap ahead in your mind about all that, that could possibly mean, there is a slight twist to this, which is what I want to explain to you today. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so every chip has a set of instructions. What do the different ones and zeros mean? Do they mean you should add a number? Do they mean you should subtract two numbers? Does it mean that you should move something to memory, fetch something from memory? And all of the different chips that exist in the world, whether they're Intel, AMD, ARM-based, you know, IBM-based, whatever they are, they have a this instruction set definition that tells the processor what it expects to do when it sees a particular number as an instruction that it fetches from memory. Now, when we talk about the ARM architecture, we're talking about three major families of uh, processors and their instruction sets that go with them. One, for example, is the Cortex-A processors, Cortex-A55, the Cortex-A77, and so on, that we find in smartphones. You might find them, let's say, in Chromebooks. You'll find them in the Raspberry Pi. You'll find them in uh, the Windows on ARM laptops, the always connected laptops, for example. The new Microsoft Surface Pro X uses an ARM Cortex-A CPU design. You'll find them in Amazon's kind of web offerings, their, their cloud server offerings. So you kind of find these complex uh, Cortex A processors that can run Linux, they can run Windows, okay, and they are all over the place. Now there are another group of, of uh, processors which they call microcontrollers, and these are much, much smaller, much, much less complicated. They run at lower uh, clock frequencies, and they don't have all the features that you would find in, say, Cortex A. So, for example, there would be no memory management unit, which means traditionally they don't run the more complicated multitasking operating systems like Linux. Instead, they would use a real time operating system like Embed OS or Free RTOS, a free real time operating system, and not Linux, not Windows, or that kind of stuff. So, something smaller. Now you'll find these microcontrollers in all manner of things, inside even the camera that I'm using now to record this video, it may well have a, a Cortex-M uh, type processor in it, inside infotainment displays in cars, in the sensors in cars, inside televisions, in fact in lots and lots of places where you see electronics, but it's not necessarily running a fully fledged multitasking, multi-user operating system, you may well find a Cortex-M processor. Now it's for the Cortex-M processors that ARM have announced that you can now add custom instructions, or when I say you can now add, of course the chip makers can add custom instructions. So there's no announcement today about custom instructions in the Cortex-A processors like we have in our smartphones. This is only about the Cortex-M uh, processors. But it's interesting because the approach that ARM are taking for Cortex-M, it raises the question, could it be also applied to Cortex-A? I suppose that's a whole separate video than this one. Now, of course, the problem with adding custom instructions is that it means now that your piece of silicon even though it's a microcontroller, will only run the software that has been compiled for that particular chip. So you kind of instantly lose any kind of general compatibility. And that's a problem when it would come to servers, when it comes to, let's say, these Windows laptops or Chromebooks or even the Raspberry Pi, because when you start to boot up, you don't know what kind of hardware you've got, you don't know whether it can support certain instructions or not, and that can cause a lot of problems. Now, there are ways around it, because, for example, there was a time when floating point operations, that's, you know, 2.179 multiplied by 3.82, wasn't handled in hardware, it was only handled in software, and some processors had the ability to do that, and there had to be a way to check whether you had the kind of the hardware-enabled floating points. So there are ways of handling this inside of more complex processors, but actually it is quite fraught with danger if it isn't done correct. However, with Cortex-M, it is slightly different because these chips are not designed for general purpose computing in the sense that you would buy a computer based on a Cortex-M and you expect it to run 
Windows, Linux, you know, Mac OS, whatever on it is actually designed for a particular piece of hardware. Like I said, the camera that I'm using to record this or the infotainment system in your car. And that's only made by Ford or by Chrysler or by, you know, Fiat or whoever. So they're kind of, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to offer that general compatibility. Even so, you still don't want to have a system where chip makers can start to diverge radically away from the core instruction set, the core processor, and kind of go off and do their own thing. So how have ARM enabled this feature so that chip makers can start to add in their own instructions? Well, the way they've done it is that actually in the Cortex uh, M33, which is part of the ARM V8M range, ARM V8M from M for microcontroller, there is already the ability to use what's called a coprocessor. Now, a coprocessor might sound a bit strange, but in fact, you're used to using a coprocessor all the time in that the GPU inside of our smartphones, the GPU maybe inside of some types of laptops and so on, is already integrated into the processor and the two have to talk to each other, sometimes almost as equals as coprocessors. I'm doing this bit, you do the graphics. You know, I'm gonna handle this, you handle that. And these two can talk to each other in different ways. One way they can talk is just over a bus. So some data is transmitted over a bus, the other processor picks it up and says, oh yes, I, I know what to do about that. And maybe there's some common memory that they can talk to and share share data. And that's maybe probably how a GPU would work uh, in, a, in a PC or in a smartphone. Another way to do it is to have a dedicated coprocessor set of instructions where you say, tell coprocessor one X, Y, Z. And basically the, pro the CPU knows that it's gonna talk to coprocessor one over some interface and that coprocessor one will do something and then come back with a defined result. And then the third way is to have a custom instruction where you want to do a certain thing and you just say, well, actually we're gonna build the hardware that does this and we're gonna bolt it onto the side of this uh, CPU. So to do that, what Armour said is, well, if you wanna do that, you can still use the same coprocessor interface. So the coprocessor interface basically says, how many registers do you want as the input and how many registers can I get back uh, as the answer. And that way it's a very structured interface between the CPU and the coprocessor, or in this case now the CPU and the custom instruction. So really it defines a fixed set of ways that the two can communicate and the CPU will say, well, now that's up to you. Here are the bits of information you need. I'll wait until you come back with the result. Other way they've done it in terms of the pipeline, remember each instruction has to be fetched from memory, has to be decoded to find out what it means, then at some point it has to be executed, and then finally the results of that execution have to be reapplied to the registers or to memory so that actually the whole system can keep on functioning. The way ARM have done that is during the execute phase, they say, using this coprocessor instruction, now please do this thing, whatever it is that you wanna do, this magic instruction that you want, please do that now and we'll wait, the pro CPU will wait until you come back with a signal that's done and then we'll carry on. And because that interface is over that coprocessor interface, what goes in and what comes out is well defined and then it can kind of roll those results back into the rest of the pipeline, go on to the next instruction and keep on going round. So what this means for software is that actually those coprocessor instructions are already there and it knows that they're well defined so you're not inventing a completely new arbitrary instruction way out left field that does something really weird. What you've actually got is this defined interface that says, I'm pretending to be a coprocessor, but I'm not actually a coprocessor, I'm actually doing it in inside of the, the CPU. And that means that actually you then come back to this idea of that if the hardware isn't there, then an error can be raised, much similar to the idea, as I said earlier, that if the floating point stuff isn't there, then it would say, oh, no floating point uh, hardware around. Uh, maybe there would already have been a check earlier on to do it in software rather than to do it in hardware. And again, because it's the microcontroller, not a server, not a laptop, not a Chromebook, not a Raspberry Pi, it's for a bespoke specialist kind of piece of equipment, car sensor, camera, whatever it is, your microwave oven, whatever it is, then the manufacturer, the, the person, the team that are building that device know very well what software goes on it. They know very well what it needs to do. And it's not something they kind of upload onto the internet, download the latest version of microwave OS, you know, or whatever, because it's not a general distribution of the software. 
And that, of course, leads to the question of why would you want to do it? Does the microcontroller not do everything that you need? Well, of course it does, and there are different categories of microcontroller. For example, our ARM have the M0 and M0 Plus microcontrollers. that are tiny, 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 weeny little microcontrollers, just 12,000 gates with 56, I think it is, instructions in them that can do that general stuff that you want to do in a, a processor. And of course, we talk about, you know, modern day processors in a smartphone might have you know, millions, even billions of transistors. These ones are just 12,000 gates, tiny, tiny things, but that's enough for controlling motors and displays and sensors and all that kind of stuff. And then as they go up through the range, you've got the M3, you've got the M4, you've got the M7, they start to add in more and more different types of instructions, including DSP type of instructions, floating point types of instructions. And when you get to the Cortex M33, it is a fully fledged microcontroller. It can do all kinds of stuff with floating point and DSPs and memory stuff, and it's great. But in the new world that we're going into in terms of, let's say, AI, for example, there are new workloads being invented uh, every day. When you get to sort of the Internet of Things, there are new ways of collecting data, of monitoring data, of storing data that you want to do quickly and efficiently in hardware that you could do in software, but actually it would take longer. So the idea now is for things like 5G, maybe, for uh, IoT, for AI, there are new workloads that a particular chip manufacturer might want to say, we are the best microcontroller manufacturer for AI, for example, and they've included some kind of neural engine and they don't want to make it a coprocessor. They actually want to build that directly in to the microcontroller. And then when a company wants to build something that has some AI stuff in it, that would pick that microcontroller. It knows it's got that extra hardware and it can kind of just write the software that it needs. So as a little example, for example, in ARM Cortex-A, uh, particularly in the NEON instructions, there is an instruction to count the number of ones in a binary word. So if you've got one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, how many ones are there? Well, we look at that, we say, well, there, there are four, there are four ones and four zeros. But a computer has to actually count them and it can do that one way is you can just shift them all to the left and the right, one pops off the end and you can count the number of ones and zeros in what's called the carry flag that goes off of the end. But actually that could take up to eight cycles because you're going left one, left one, left one. And of course, that's a long time in computing terms. Wouldn't it be great if you could have some kind of hardware that said, Bosch, just tell me there are four ones in that. And in Cortex-A Neon, you can do that. There is a count bits instruction, but that count bits instruction does not exist in Cortex-M and probably will never exist in Cortex-M. But if an OEM wanted to design a chip that had a count bits instruction in it, now it can using that coprocessor interface, but actually including the hardware inside of the CPU itself as a custom instruction, which is, would be called coprocessor instruction number one, this number of inputs, this number of outputs, it would go away, do its bit of clever stuff in hardware and come back with the answer. And then the processor would carry on doing its other instructions. Okay, so that's about it. So basically this is the idea for microcontrollers, dedicated uh, workload, AI, 5G, uh, IoT, and so on, that microcontrollers can now actually do specific tasks in hardware, which ultimately makes them more efficient, means the battery lasts longer, and of course makes them faster than reproducing the same thing, let's say, in software. And the twist, as I said at the beginning, is that this is only for microcontrollers, which have a much more restricted uh, kind of development environment, much more restricted release pattern than let's say something general like Windows on a, on a, on a laptop or Chrome OS on a Chromebook or a, running Linux on a server in Amazon's cloud services. This is a much more restrictive set of, uh, of an environment, which means this kind of thing is possible. Okay, my name's Gary Sims. This is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I hope I made all that clear about how they're adding in those custom instructions. If you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up. Also, don't forget to subscribe. Please share this video on social media. Tell your friends about this channel. And I suppose that's about it. I'll see you in the next one.